Episode 37 with Lama Surya Das. Where meditation meets daily life, this is the Meditation Freedom Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Meditation Freedom Podcast. My name is Sikha Road, and this podcast is all about meditation, mindfulness, why we do it, and how we bring that into our daily lives, how we integrate that. And today's interview is going to be with Lama Surya Das. He is a well-known Western Buddhist meditation teacher and scholar, and one of the main interpreters of Tibetan Buddhism in the West. The Dalai Lama affectionately calls him the Western Lama. Surya Das has spent over 45 years studying Zen, Vipassana, Yoga, and Tibetan Buddhism with the great teachers of Asia, including the Dalai Lama's own teachers. And as he'll talk about in the interview, he has also twice completed a traditional three-year meditation cloistered retreat at his teacher's Tibetan monastery. He's also the founder of the Zogen Center in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and its branch centers around the country where Lama Surya Das conducts long training retreats and advanced Dzogchen retreats. He's also active in interfaith dialogue and charitable projects in the third world. Recently, he has also turned his efforts and focus towards youth and contemplative education initiatives, what he calls true higher education and wisdom for life training. Surya Das is also a speaker and lecturer, teaching and conducting meditation retreats and workshops around the world, and he also has published over 13 books at the time of this recording. Surya Das has also been featured in numerous publications and major media, including ABC, CNN, MSNBC, NPR, The Washington Post, and I put a couple of links to uh, some comedy episodes from the Colbert Report and that you may want to enjoy uh, checking out when you're checking out the uh, show notes. You can find out more about Lama Surya Das and check out the show notes with links to his various websites and other resources by going to meditationfreedom.com slash 37. So with that, here's the interview with Lama Surya Das. Well, thank you so much, Lama Surya Das, for joining me on this Meditation Freedom Podcast. What a pleasure. I'm into meditation and even better, freedom. Awesome. And uh, we, as we discussed a little bit earlier, if you wouldn't mind doing a little mini meditation or, or, or guided meditation as the introduction, that would be uh, delightful. Sure. Siko, it's always a good place to start and continue. Maybe we'll just keep silent for the whole 45 minutes. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's really a good idea for a podcast, but we could revolutionize the medium. Right. <laughs> anyway, let's have a little... Instant meditation, kind of very American. And so, friends, meditate as fast as you can. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. With an out breath, just say ah and relax. Breathe in and again, I don't hear you. Ah, ah, ah. what a relief. And again, for the third time, the seed syllable of Dzogchen, Tibetan meditation. Ah. Uh, Self totally. <sighs> Enjoying a moment of mindfulness, of contemplative sweetness, of just being, getting off the treadmill of events and the momentum of our conditioning and drivenness and just breathing, just sitting, just being present, attentive, lucidly aware, mindful, rather than mindlessly sleepwalking through life. Just sitting, natural body is Buddha's body. Let it be, just sitting, relaxed and at ease. Second, just breathing, natural breath and energy is Buddha's breath and energy. Just breathing, letting it go, letting flow. Just sitting, just breathing. And third, just being present and awareful. Awaring, awareness is a verb. 
pay attention, friends, it pays off. Aware of physical sensations in the body in the present moment. Aware of breathing, breathing in, breathing out, mindfulness of breathing. And third, aware of awareness itself, aware of thoughts, memories, moods, not trying to suppress them. Mindfulness of thoughts is meditation, not trying not to think. Aware of awareness itself, incandescent presence, choiceless awareness. Nowness awareness is the true Buddha within. Letting everything come and go as it goes. The secret is letting go, letting come and go, letting be. That's the secret, letting be as it is. Aware, open, friendly, accepting. And enjoy the joy of natural meditation. This breath, as if the only breath, this moment as if the only moment. Enjoy the joy of naturalness, of genuine meditation. Jon Chu Sam Chok Rinpo Chu Makye Panang Kye Gyo Chu Kye Pa Nyan Pa Me Pa Yon Kone Kandu Pa Wa Shou May all beings be happy, peaceful, in harmony, fulfilled and serene healed and whole again, and may we all together fulfill the promise of the spiritual journey. One family, one Sangha community, one world, all beings, love to one and all. And I bow to the Buddha in your seat. Don't overlook her. Well, that 45 minutes went quick. <laughs> Yeah, wonderful. I, they should do that instead of uh, God Bless America. I, I, I like that. It's a nice idea. God bless everyone. That's what I say. Be right. Bless. Let's be a blessing in this world, a light rather than a blight on the landscape. The world needs it. Yes, definitely. Well, thank you. You're welcome. That was a little natural meditation. You can find these in my different books, which are like workbooks full of practices you can do. Like breathe, relax, center, and smile. Four steps to instant meditation, that kind of thing. It's not that complicated. Of course, there's 2,600 years of ethics, meditation, and wisdom and love practices behind all that, the whole Eightfold Path. But breathe, relax, center, and smile. Or there's three pillars of natural meditation, natural, just sitting, just breathing, just being aware. These are great practices for today, secular, non-sectarian, no beliefs or conversions needed. Exactly, right. Yeah, I definitely want to ask you about that regarding your latest book. But maybe, uh, if you don't mind, for starters, what I'd like to ask, what I usually ask my guests on the show is what brought them to this practice. And, uh, and it looked like in your book, the Kent State was a, was a real a turning point in, in your life or, or something that, that really propelled you yes. to practice? Well, I grew up in the 50s and 60s. I went to college in New York at the University of Buffalo. And 
my best high school friend, Barry Levine's girlfriend, Allison Krauss, was shot and killed at Kent State, her campus, her university, in May of 1970, along with three other students. She was 19. Wow, yeah. It was a big tragedy. And she was running away from the part-time soldiers, the Ohio National Guard, who shot the crowd of students who were demonstrating the secret bombings of Cambodia and Vietnam by Nixon and Kissinger during the Vietnam War era. So that really turned my head around about fighting for peace and the radical anti-war movement. And I wanted to be for something positive and become peace and make peace and be a peacemaker in the world mm -hmm. rather than fighting for peace, which became increasingly, obviously, a contradiction in terms. Like today we have suicide bombers killing for God in the name of God. Right. I don't think that this is exactly what God has in mind for us. And there's nothing new about this kind of fanaticism. It's been going on for centuries and millennia. We have to deal with this and it's part of our, you know, human society. We have to deal with it. Um, so I, when I graduated from college, I went to India instead of studying. I had met meditation, Zen retreats, encounter groups, of course, consciousness research and experiments in the 60s of all kinds, legal and otherwise. And yeah. I went to India in, in 1971, the minute I graduated from college. I flew to London, hitchhiked across Europe and the Middle East, countries we can't visit so easily today if we're Americans, like Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and to India. Then went to my first 10-day mindfulness course, med Vipassana course, inside meditation course, in o August of 1971 with people like Sharon Salzberg and Dan Goldman and Mirabai Bush and other of our current mindfulness teachers in America today. Mm -hmm. And um, that's how I got into these things. And then I met my first Tibetan Lamas and my guru, Nim Karoli Baba, who named me Suridas, Maharaji, who named me Suridas, and other people in 71 and 72. And I was there most of the 70s and 80s, became a Buddhist monk, did three and a half year Lama, a Tibetan Buddhist cloistered retreat trainings for lamas and things like that. I did that twice in the 80s and uh, learned Tibetan and I was over there a long time. Yeah. And started being invited to teach by some of those Vipassana teachers actually. I taught them Dzogchen, my lineage of Tibetan Buddhism and um, at their retreat centers and all in Europe and America starting in 1989. So that's how I got into all this and by the 90s you know, I started to write books and speak and organize retreats. I started the Dzogchen Centers in America, and you can look that online, Dzogchen.org or Surya.org, my websites and other things. So that's what I do, teaching, writing, and social activism. I think of it as spiritual service or spiritual activism, trying to right. make, make a positive difference in the world, be a bodhisattva, an edifier, an awakener, a light in this world. Mm -hmm. Now I'm getting older, so a spiritual elder, a role that we sorely need today. The young people, they don't necessarily want authorities or religious leaders or trust political leaders, and yet they're, we're all thirsty for this timeless wisdom, self-knowledge, inner peace, outer heart, peace and harmony, how to heal the planet and the climate issues. This is not very um, esoteric. And everybody's interested in this today, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And and, and do you remember? Because I I did read in your book also. You said um, as a teenager, you read a line that said, "The whole universe is my body. All beings are my mind." Was there something? Because at the time, you may not have realized it really deeply that that particular line, right? I mean, right? You know, no, of course. When I when I uh, when I was in college doing those, let's say. Uh, Consciousness experiments, it was the 60s, need I say more? I may have inhaled, who knows, who can remember? I was at Woodstock, yes, Woodstock won, everybody I know was there, everybody I knew was in college in Northeast in those days, we all went to Woodstock. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I read the things like Aldous Huxley's perennial philosophy, um, Carlos Castaneda's Yaki way of knowledge about his yeah, yeah, master in Mexico, Don Juan, 
and other things, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, translated by Evans Wentz, that Timothy Leary talked and wrote about himself. He wrote the book of Tibetan Book of Psychedelic Experience or something. And so I read that, what, what you quoted, but I had no idea. I mean, I, I was a kid, and I had been a jock growing up. I mean, I, I wasn't interested in religion. Who was interested in religion in the suburbs in the 50s and in New York in the 60s? So I had no idea, and I didn't study philosophy at college. I was into psychology, political science, creative writing, things like that. Um, so now, even when I look in, you know, the few notebooks I have from those days, from my 20s, I find these things that I wrote down then. I mean, maybe I remember one but, or two, but maybe I have a few dozen in some of these little notebooks from, from back then. And it's amazing. It's amazing how much was there and how little one understood about it, you know, when you were a kid. Yeah. yeah. And also hormone driven, anti, you know, countercultural, the Vietnam era and so on. So, but then it all starts to come back as you open your third eye, your wisdom eye, you know, and you start to see things differently. And um, when I came back from India, then I saw many of these timeless truths, even in the Bible and in Western thought, humanism, psychology, and um, of course Judaism, Judaism and Christianity, uh, there's plenty in there. But growing up, we weren't that experienced or interested in that. Nobody taught us really how to pray or meditate or do bring it into our bodies or our lives. It was more like go on Sunday and listen to an old person give a boring sermon while you um, read a little uh, paperback in your lap about some, but something far different. Right. I, I was the same way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's what we did. Um, I, of course, I'm Jewish on my parents' side, so I was bar mitzvahed. I went to Hebrew school, but there was nothing of interest there for me. When I asked all my millions of questions, they would say, Shek it, Bakupi. Quiet, little monkey. <laughs> be quiet you know shh check it in Hebrew shh okay I'll try but then interestingly uh, Siko you'll, you'll appreciate this and you know perhaps our listeners to especially if they're younger when I was in India and I landed there after college when I was 20 I went to the meditation course of course uh, the 10 day mindfulness course with Gawankaji Sharon Salisbury's main teacher um, we were silent for 10 days, so there wasn't that much questions, and the teacher gave a one-hour talk every night and instructed us, and we meditated silently all day in one-hour sessions, which the Insight Meditation School is still carrying on here in this country, Goldstein, Kornfeld, Salzburg, Tara mm -hmm. Brock, and others, excellent teachers, Mirabai Bush, etc. John Kabat-Zinn is an offshoot of that. And mindfulness-based stress reduction, terrific mindfulness training. Mm -hmm. Anyway, when I was with my first Lama, Kalu Rinpoche, the late great Kalu Rinpoche, one of the old grand old masters of Tibet and lived at his monastery in Darjeeling, he was the Dalai Lama's teacher of the six yogas, Tibetan tantric yogas. I used to pepper him with questions and he, was, he used to teach a lot, um, half of every day, let's say, for hours. And there wasn't so much silence or sitting in his monastery. It was more teaching and ritual and also work. It was a refugee camp, taking care of the sick people and the old people and building uh, schools and infirmaries and even huts and houses. So I, one day I asked him, Rinpoche, is it okay if I ask you all these questions? I'm taking up all your time. You have so many other important things to do and people to see. And he said, ask me all of your questions. Then you too will, one day, you too will know. So that was very empowering. Right. That was quite right. different than my religious, in quotes, upbringing. So then I used to ask some questions. He also gave me practices, self-inquiry, uh, ways of thinking, some, you know, basic Buddhist philosophy and psychology and things. So things I could learn about and, and how to meditate and look into myself, my mind, my feelings, uh, and, and others, relationships you know, ethics and moral precepts, uh, how to develop virtues like generosity and patience, not just believe in them. Oh, Jesus could lear love the enemy, but that has nothing to do, I don't know how. Right. He taught us how to exchange self and others 
in Tibetan Tonglen. Put yourself in the other's shoes. Right. right. Equalizing yourself and others. Tonglen practice. So practices. So that was very and of course Tibetan mindfulness and awareness practices and other things, Tibetan yoga, prayers and chants. So I really encourage people to question, seek, inquire. Yeah. With the, find out for yourself. Don't just take it on blind faith. Of course, we're Americans anyway. Most of us won't. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and do, you, uh, do you think that, that we have to journey into separateness, into a sense of self and other before, so we can fully appreciate non-separateness? Yes. That, that's really the universal pageant, um, Siko. You know, it's a little hard to talk about. So let me talk about it in English since we, you know, think in English. We're all Americans here. Right. I know, not you, but, you know, in general, all the, the normal people here, we're like thick in English. So God created the world because he, he or she likes a good story or he or she was a lonely. So that's a kind of like an amusing way of looking at it from the point of view of the whole journey back to the Garden of Eden or oneness or God or beyond separation. First, you have to be separate to experience union. Otherwise, you have no perspective. Mm-hmm. As St. Kabir, the poet, mystic of India, sang, the fish doesn't know the sea that they're in. Right. So the bubble has to burst to return to the sea, but it's never been apart. So we, you know, we're conceived and we cut the umbilical cord and we become separate and grow up and individuate. And these are healthy stages of development, but then we also have to become more independent and grow up and individuate and be, have a healthy ego, not be an egotistical bastard, mm -hmm. and then start to recognize interconnection and interdependence within and have autonomy within interdependence, not just be independent like a teenager wants, but what, find autonomy and freedom within interdependence. So recognize that we're not separate, that we're all interconnected. As we can see on the global level today, with the global economy and concerns about the global environment and the ozone layer, layer and water and, and the rising seas and things like that. We're all connected. We can't just think about what's going on in our village or our country anymore and not worry about climate change and bigger things. And then also individually, it takes a village. Nobody can do it alone today. It's not the age of specialists or isolationism anymore. Believe me, I've tried. I was a monk, Buddhist monk in Tibetan monastery for eight or nine years. We need each other to develop compassion, empathy, and loving kindness, as the Dalai Lama says, not just wisdom from the forehead up. So I think the whole journey is about coming home to oneness or ourselves. The subtitle of my new book, Make Me One With Everything, is Buddhist meditations to awaken from the illusion of separation. Right, right. And so we have to experience separation in order to come back, just like with love. We can't know love unless we feel a little separate. Then we can experience the oneness and the union of being one and together as we come together and apart in healthy relationship dance. Yeah, yeah, it is kind of a dance, isn't it? Yeah. And when you became a, a monk for those eight years, when you still thought it was a separate journey, what was the was there a point at which you realized that was that you need that your perspective was shifting from that sense of separateness, separate individual journey to you know we're part of a, a larger whole. Well, it was very gradual, I would say, in the sense that. When I was growing up, I was always on sports teams and in family and intact family and brothers and sisters and friends and neighborhood and stayed in one neighborhood and, you know, just going through schools together with my friends and being on all the sports teams and with my buddies. And that was great. And then also in college and later a little bit more inner and going on the, the sacred journey with hallucinogens and other things and starting to like write poetry and creatively and songs and develop my inner. So that was a little more of the separate. Yeah, 
right. like self growth, self development. Although I still had lots of you know with friends and women, you know, girls and and life uh, relations. My teachers in India and in Nepal, Sikkim, Tibet, even in Japan, where I was for one year studying Zen and teaching English, um, were mostly monks or monastic style. So they wanted us to become monks or nuns and do like the Tibetan, my Tibetan Lama Kalurim started the first three year Lama training retreats in the West for Westerners. So he wanted us to do that. So that's why I went into that. But I never really believed or thought I would be a monk my whole life. I wanted to, although I stayed in the Asian side for almost 20 years, I, I wanted to come back to my own culture and place and time and make a difference. Right. Not be an expat or not know the language or sort of not be able to work legally, you know, in foreign countries. You know, it's different if you live there and you learn language and you get married or you're part of the, the scene there and then you live there, that's good. Like you're Dutch and you emigrated to America and you're married here and now you're fully American because it's America's a big melting pot. Right. But in India in those days, we were kind of separate and, you know, like sahibs and memsabs and like the British invaders sort of. So um, I really want to come back to my own time and culture and eventually I did and started teaching and counseling and writing and organizing things and being spiritual activist and as a monk it's very hard to do some of those things like monk, Buddhist monks traditionally of course they have, have vows and we're not going into all that but you know they, they don't touch money and they, they don't right. have right. intimate relations and uh, with you know, sex might be a word we think of here. And other things accumulate things. So it was a little hard to imagine continuing that. And it sort of wasn't my vocation anyway. I'm a, a people person and a, a, a devotional kind of heart. I don't know, bhakti we say in India, like a lover of life and of people and of God and God and people, God and nature, God and animals. So I didn't intend to stay a monk forever. So after 89 years, when our three-year retreats were over and I started teaching and traveling, I, I gave up those vows and robes. Because and, my message, Siko, is like, if, if I can do it, you can do it. Anybody can do it. Right. I'm not different. Don't look up to me. I'm not the Dalai Lama. You know, don't idealize me. I'm just a Jewish jock from Long Island. Um, like a player coach, let's play, you know, do these practices together. I'm practicing, you're practicing together. And um, it's a wonderful, joyous spiritual path. And I love the beloved community, the Sangha, the Satsang of kind kindred spirits on this journey together. Yeah. So gradually I got used to that idea and starting to see that this is not the time just to think about, first of all, for selfishness, it's never the time, but self-growth and self-development and, and isolationism and just closing my eyes and going inward and being silent for years. This is the era of integration, integration, right. collaboration, of occupying the spirit, of the 99% occupying the spirit, not just the 1% waiting for the Dalai Lama or Mother Teresa to do it. Yeah. And yeah. I think this is very important. So that's why I wrote this new book about co-meditation, intermeditation, awakening together. Yeah, and and I I could tell by the way you wrote it because you it's almost like you want you want to take the me out of meditation, and so that's why you kind of created a new word intermeditation. Yes, is, is that kind of your thinking behind it? That's my thinking exactly yeah. from from meditation meditation to weeditation right <laughs> meditation. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. So co meditation, not just with people, but with animals, with nature. Right. With with the lake, with the tree, with the sun, with the with the sky, with the sound of the waves. And let them do it for you, wash over you and through you and relax a little and be open, not just close our eyes and try to get away from it all. But be with it, not out of it. Not try to get away from it. Be with it, not against it. Be with it. Loving kindness means friendliness and openness. Right. Metta. Right. Friendliness, openness, not just kindness. And friendly and open to what comes up in us, too, to our own inner noumena, 
the phenomena outside, but the mental stuff, the minds and feelings and body state, inner, the noumena, friendly and open and accepting and healthily integrating it all in our open heart and big mind. Yeah, yeah. That's the big mindfulness. Remindfulness, remembering to remember what we're doing, what we're doing it, not just trying to get away from it all or stop thinking. Right, yeah. It, to me, the sense of integration that you're talking about is where you used to maybe spend, uh, or and we all did, uh, spend a lot of time on the little self and ignored the big self, and now the right. big self is more in the foreground and the little self is in service of the big self. Hopefully, yes. And at the same That's time, right. at the same time, like you said, we still need to develop the little self or the our, our own unique expression of the big self which is mm -hmm. which is non-repeatable and it has unique skills and talents that still need to because some people will 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 think uh who start meditation will think oh i got to kill my ego or 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 toss it away but then no. they're then they're all towards the the one self and forgetting about also taking care of their own unique expression because the world needs everyone to be to be there to show up, authentic. right? Authentic, yeah. Right. I think authentic is a hard word to define, but it's so important. And uh, no need to kill anything or kill your ego. You know, anti-ego is just another kind of egotism. Like I'm the worst. I'm the most selfish. That's ego. That's right. like pride. Oh, I'm better, worse than anyone else. I'm greater, worse than anyone else. Right. See? So, I think Buddha's greatest teaching is the middle way: not too much and not too little. Mm -hmm. Not too tight, not too loose, not ascetic, and not indulgent. And there's plenty of room in between. It's not a razor's edge. There's a lot of lanes in the great highway of authentic awakening and the awakened life, the mindful life, the beautiful, loving, true life that we deserve. Not in an entitled way that everyone deserves and can have and participate in equally. Uh, uh, there's a lot of lanes in this great highway. Just let's try to stay out of the ditches on either side of the highway. Right, right. Nihilism, nothing matters. Materialism. Everything is as real as it seems. And if we can't weigh it or see it, it's not real. That's materialism. So nihilism and materialism are like ditches on the side, extreme views, or this kind of, you know, killing for God mentality. Meanwhile, there's a lot of lanes in the, in, in, in the Great Highway, including the different religions, humanism, and even atheists and agnostics are some of the most religious or spiritual people I know. There's mm -hmm. lanes, room for all. all right. Suicide bombings and, and, and you know, genocide, not so much room in my mind for that. Yes. We have to deal with it. It's part, it's part of life, all right. for sure. And the inequalities and, and injustices of life help further those problems. So we have to make some systemic changes, not just change ourselves. Of course, when I, when my eyes, vision, when I, I become clearer, everything becomes clearer. That's Buddha's basic premise. Mm -hmm. That's why we meditate, concentrate, do self-inquiry, and so on. But still, we have to work on the outer level as well as the inner level. It's election year. I know it's just a local presidential election in this country, but it's an important time to step up and speak out. If you don't vote, I don't want to hear you complaining about what's wrong with politics in Washington. Right, right. Definitely. I mean, you're free to do that, complain, but I don't want to hear about it. So being an informed citizen is a co-meditation in a way and participating. If you're a parent, you know, you got to participate with the children, not just send them off to school and hope somebody else will do it all. Sometimes you have to go to the school for parents night or f stand up for them, or for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. So, this is a time for integration, not getting away from it all. Of course, having said that, I got away from it all for long times. I still lead meditation retreats, silent meditation retreats year-round. You can see my schedule at surya.org website, or on my Twitter and Facebook feeds. But I still talk a lot about integration, and um, service, selfless service, seva, and so forth. I think it's very important for all of us today. And linking our hands and hearts and heads and not just trying to get away from it all or find inner peace for ourselves. We're all in the same boat, Sika. We rise and fall, sink or swim together. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's that co meditation, co co creating. Yes. 
Yeah, and we got a lot more to do with all these, <clears throat> uh, as you say, terrorism, and now, now there's more school shootings, which seems to also be another symptom of alienation and separation. Yes, um, it's terrible. We have to do something about that. And the education system in North America is in crisis, but the gun problem is even more of a crisis than the education problem. I don't know what we're going to do about it. There's some pretty entrenched lobbies mm -hmm. around that issue. But um, maybe we need to implement more mindful anger management in law enforcement so people learn how to think before they react and respond before they react blindly. Maybe we need to implement more mindful anger management among uh, teachers and um, institutional leaders and even with the children. It's hard to bring meditation and yoga into school because of religious um, issues. Right, right. But there's plenty of it. It's coming. It is. And that's yeah. a good thing. And mindful anger management could go a long way to reducing the violence that's becoming so endemic to our society. These school shootings and mass killings are becoming like a national characteristic. Yeah. It's infuriating. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it and doesn't happen in Canada where they, you know, the policemen don't even carry guns. There's very few guns there. In this country, there's more guns than people. I yeah. just read there's more than 400 million guns in this country. I know. I don't have a gun. I don't know if you have a gun. Nope. It means there's a lot of people that have several guns. Right. There's yeah. a lot of children that don't have guns. There's a lot of adults that have a hell of a lot of guns. Yeah. yeah. I don't know why. And automatic weapons, not just a hunting rifle. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. inner peace and outer peace and harmony have to go together. I'm all for it. Yeah. And you Let's mentioned... together for it. And, and you mentioned in your book, um, there's... Well, and, and and we can all see it. There's a massive movement towards mindfulness uh, for the goal to be happy and healthy. But in your book, uh, you also mentioned that people do miss out on some of the spiritual benefits if they only go for the uh, the the you know more mindful this or right or effectiveness training. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's probably always been this way. Um, you know, it's different societies commodify or or generalize the things that they import. Um, like yoga has come to this country since the 50s and 60s, and it's a wonderful thing. There's yoga studios in every corner and yoga classes in every YMCA and health spa and everywhere else. Um, probably in the armed forces too, I don't know. I haven't checked lately. But yoga just for health, Yoga just for exercise is missing out on the real meaning of yoga, which is union. Mm -hmm. Yoga means to yoke, to co connect, union with God, union with the highest, whatever, union with the oneness. So it's missing out on the spiritual dimensions, the eight limb yoga, not just physical yoga, not just yoga for health. Similarly, meditation and mindfulness. Mindfulness for effectiveness, mindfulness just for relaxation and stress relief is terrific. But mindfulness is part of the Buddhist path of awakening. It brings enlightenment. It brings other benefits. It brings wisdom development. It brings less selfishness, more openness and generosity and friendliness. So I wouldn't want us to lose out on those aspects. And just, you know, like if prayer became only to pray for what you want, right. like kids writing a letter to Santa, it would be a big loss. It would be, yeah. And if mindfulness becomes only about us getting what we think we want, like feeling a little better, yeah, a bigger high, blood pressure and stress, or even getting high, it would be a loss from the point of view of wisdom and cultivation and development, awareness practice, uh, self-knowledge development, uh, unselfishness, uh, attitude transformation, and so on, other aspects of mindfulness. So when I teach about like mindfulness or Tibetan mindfulness, there's six kinds of mindfulness, not just uh, one or two. And um, there's a lot to say about this. It's a very, very, very rich subject. Yeah. And it's also about soulfulness and heartfulness, not just about the mind. Again, that's a very American trait. You know, we love the mind and thoughts. We're thinkaholics. Yeah. We're addicted to thinking. But there's life without thinking sometimes. Sometimes we're having experience and we're still there, but we're not thinking. Right. Like in the throes of ecstatic lovemaking 
or in other situations, extreme exercise. So, or when we wake up in a dream and know we're dreaming, we're not just thinking, you know, lucid dreaming. So, just also pulling. a good servant, but a poor master with too much under its power. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because this is why I stress awareness. I, I really appreciate the uh, my uncle who was a priest at the time. He told me that he yelled the most hugest profound profanities, and, but it, he said, "Get down!" Because my head was about to get sliced off by a bridge. We were on a boat wow. going under a bridge, and and so there is that kind of response. Still, exactly. if we're too much in our head, we we miss out on, on that. Yes, you can't legislate that. I mean, he saved your life by, right. you know, cursing at the top of his lungs. I mean, that's we call that wrathful compassion, not anger. Exactly. Yeah. Like if, if your children are running in the street, you scream. You don't just tiptoe silently, mindfully toward the street. Exactly. So save them. Yeah. That would be insane. And spiritual life, meditation, all these practices make us more sane, not insane. Yes, ideally, yeah. Ideally. Meditation is a good friend with benefits. That's all I'm saying. I wouldn't want it just to be mindfulness for effectiveness or yoga for health. Yeah, and that does does require a, a sense of, um, I, I guess, a balance between taking the practice seriously and also not too seriously, also lightly. Yes. And th that's another balance you got to learn over, over, over time. Right. Well... Life ain't much fun if we take ourselves too seriously, and I think it's one of the downsides of religion today. It's become so intimidating and so sectarian, and we should really work, I believe, to transform the atmosphere of spirituality today and apply it to daily life in many different ways. Like I was talking about mindful anger management and other things, and of course health and stress reduction is all good. Meditation is a good friend with benefits. Mm -hmm. and we need to lighten up as well as enlighten up. So... Um, you know, joy is one of the four boundless virtues of Buddhist practice. Also, joy in the good fortune of others, rejoicing. But joy, it's, a, it's an important virtue that we cultivate, not um, just thinking this world sucks and waiting for the next world. Exactly, right. And, and in a way, your, your book title, Make Me One With Everything, is, is from a joke, right? Maybe you can... Mention the joke real quick. If of course, it's from a joke. Uh, I assume everybody knows it, and it is in my book from the 1990s, Awakening the Buddha Within. But here's the joke. By the way, I'm proud that Sirius Das has the only book title that I know of in which the title is the punchline of a joke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Seiko, you come from a, 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 another country, San Diego. You probably don't know what did the Dalai Lama say to the hot dog vendor in Bronx. Well, yeah, I I did hear the joke before, but so tell us what did he say for our listeners? Well, uh, the Dalai Lama walked up to the hot dog vendor and said, "Make me one with everything." Right, that's 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 the joke. <laughs> but then there's more. There's more. He had yes. a few extra innings. So then the, the vendor starts making the hot dog and slathering it on with. If you're not a New Yorker, you need to be explained. You know, the sweet relish and the crappy onions and the mustard and ketchup together. And these days, maybe some other things. Who knows what? Right. Bean sprouts, bacon bits. One with everything. Like those pizzas that has so much stuff on it. So bake me one with everything. And then the vendor hands over the hot dog to the Dalai Lama. And the Dalai Lama hands over a $10 bill. And then there's a pregnant si pause. There's a silence. Are they meditating? Is it a staring <laughs> contest? What's going on? Is there some misunderstanding? Pregnant pause. Then the Dalai Lama finally gives in. He cracks. He speaks first. What? No change? The hot dog vendor says, change must come from within. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I love that. That's not too shabby for a homemade joke. No, it's a great joke. Yeah. So, lightening up while enlightening up, not taking ourselves too seriously. And also cultivating the joy. You know, life is a miracle. We didn't create it. Every day we get up is a good day. We're not dead. We all know people younger than us who are dying or died or have dread diagnoses or impairments. Um, there are parts of the world where people are, you know, in, in wars and famines all the time, most of the time, or poverty or oppression, slavery even. 
So life is miraculous. I mean, just the beautiful nature around us and the freedoms we have in this kind, great country, for example, the freedoms we have, with everything that's wrong with this country, the freedoms we have, mm-hmm. and the religious freedoms, and the other freedoms of speech and so on. Let me add, especially if we're a white person, but that's a different subject. Right, right. It is a great country and more increasingly diverse. So I Proper. practice this kind of reverence and gratitude every day, and that makes my heart more joyful and more resilient. I'm more resilient, less brittle, and less fearful, less, less cautious, more free, more uh, spontaneous because of resilience. I can give and take. I can breathe in and breathe out with, with things, co-meditate with the difficulties as well as, you know, with the people I like and things like that. I have much more resilience or patience or uh, forbearance or tolerance and, and just um, joy, really, buoyance. It's a buoyant awakening. Right, yeah, and the meditation practice is something that, that helps you get more of that appreciation and, and, and resilience. Yes, it's like that American Express. Yeah, don't leave home without it. I, I can't live without it. I meditate every day. Mm-hmm. I've been meditating every day since 1971 when I did my first 10-day mindfulness course with Mr. Goenka in India that I was mentioning before. Of course, I learned to meditate in 68 and on, but I couldn't really do it every day in college but um, in India. And since then, and sometimes twice a day, sometimes in retreats all day, half the day, whatever. Sometimes I take Sabbath off or half a Sabbath or a quarter of a Sabbath for three or four hours and meditate, pray, chant, walk outside without earbuds and things like that, you know, mm-hmm. just walking meditation or natural meditation or sky gazing, lie down and just dissolve into the sky or co-meditate with water or the bonfire or the hearth. Co-meditation helps us integrate, intermeditate with everything, every moment, even if we're in a busy place. Yeah, yeah, and it seems like the lack of appreciation is one of the reasons why there's so much depression and people yeah. have problems with the world. Well, you're, you're a big boy, you understand, you see how the difference between seeing the half of the glass that's empty or the half that's full, or if things are never good enough for you, if you're a perfectionist, or worse, you know, insatiable craving or addiction, how those things cycle. And it's hard to get out of it by doing more of the same things that you're stuck in. You have to make a quantum leap, not just a little uh, adjustment like, oh, I'll, I'm not an alcoholic, I'll just drink a little less. Well, mm-hmm. good luck to you if that works. Yeah. From my understanding, the 12-step program and stopping totally is the best and almost the only really effective program for alcoholics and maybe other addictions too. So I'm for the middle way, but sometimes you have to be a little more all or nothing about certain things. So with the bad habits, with the afflictions, with things like depression or other pathologies, maybe we need some help. Maybe we need medical or psychiatric help or chemical intervention. Maybe we need to change our diet or our lifestyle if we can change our ways of thinking. So back to what I believe in is experiential practices, not just converting to another religion or joining a different political party. There's so much the same, but doing the inner work Mm -hmm. on oneself and together and asking for help and getting help from others who have more experience can be very helpful. So meditation, self-inquiry, support groups, therapy, yoga, tai chi, you know, whatever you do, or your favorite hobby or avocation. Maybe for you it's gardening, maybe kneeling in the sun is your way of being closest to the one, to the ultimate, rather than kneeling in a church where you have all kinds of other issues and associations. Maybe the earth and the garden is it, maybe some creative art is it. So authenticity, we have to really be honest with ourselves if we're truth seekers, I think, and not fool ourselves or just imitate somebody else's way, but right. learn and also adapt it and apply it to ourselves in our life, at home and at work and with others and alone and with our 
youngers, with our elders, with the other species, etc. Yeah. And as a teacher, you've, you've taught for quite a few years, and what kind of problems do you, or issues do you see your, struggling, your students struggle the most with, perhaps in terms of, uh, you know, feeling less separate or... Uh, well, I shouldn't tell on them from their, their private <laughs> consultations and all, but it's no secret, it's no secret that Westerners mostly struggle with mental stuff. Mm-hmm. Less so with poverty and disease and other things that people might struggle with in other parts of the world, you know, being refugees or et cetera, um, or genocide, but or having their family members kidnapped or disappeared. Most of my students don't have that. Well, some right. are from other cultures or unfortunate circumstances here. What most Westerners and people like, a lot of my students are, you know, Westerners, North Americans, some others struggle with is mostly relationships. Relationships. And again, and that does touch on what you're asking about, about the, the journey for oneness, the search for love and wholeness, the feelings of incompleteness, mm -hmm. the feelings of loneliness and isolation. And again, the mental things like meaninglessness, um, wondering what it's all about in life and is this all or why bad things happen to good people you know so many women get diagnosed with breast cancer or uterine cancer uh, just so many people have ill children or parents or someone to take siblings to take care of so these are the things people have always struggled with and we're struggling with here in this country and that's why I'm thinking that co-meditation, intermeditation, being with it, not trying to get away from it, the difficulty, the challenge, the, quote, enemy, which doesn't have to be a person, it could be a disease, whatever the unwanted is, to breathe with it and learn to tolerate it, be more patient with it, less resistance, see through the illusion of separation, is a great antidote to all this generally mental suffering. Right. And when you say see so through the, the illusion of separation, you don't just mean an intellectual understanding of... No, I mean, that's what I said, we're breathing with it and yeah. tolerate it. Like, if you, have, if you have difficult feelings like anxiety, learning to befriend the anxiety and not fighting against it, and wish, thinking it has to go away, or over-medicating it away. Mm -hmm. it's just like sweeping crap under the rug where it festers. Right. We're throwing radioactive waste in the ocean, so we don't have to deal with it. Of course, our children will have to deal with it. So there's all kinds of practices for, you know, just like natural childbirth, you breathe into the pain and other things like that can help tolerate the pain without anesthetics. So I'm not necessarily advising that. I'm just saying that's a good example, even with great physical pain, how breathing and relaxing and awareness practice, moving your attention can move your world in a positive direction. Yeah. Moving your attention can move your world in a positive direction. And um, recognizing the interconnectedness, like putting yourself in the other's shoes. If you have an enemy, if you have a bad boss, a bad employee, a bad neighbor, you know, bad is subjective, but if you have a problematic relationship, if you put yourself in their shoes and see it through their eyes, you might see things very differently. Mm -hmm. Like if you and I w were brought up in Nazi Germany, we might have been in the Hitler Youth. Mm -hmm. I forget his name, who was the head of the UN. He wasn't a Nazi, he was a kid. Like when I grew up, we were in the Boy Scouts. Everybody was in the Hitler Youth. So if we grew up there, we might have been in that. Yeah. So, I don't know that I would be a suicide bomber, but you have to say that these extreme religionists from the Middle East, they're very loyal to their place, their parents, the madrasas, the schools that they were trained in and brought up in, just like we are to ours. They're not that different. We have a universal commonality, being human beings, we're like 98% or 95% water, just like they are. We love our children, we, we, we get old and die, and you know, just like them, we love our land. We're not that different. No. We've got to find some common ground. It doesn't mean we all have to agree or have the same religion. I'm not saying that. 
But look what's happening in the nation's capital, this great impasse. The Republicans and the Democrats are so separate and so partisan. Mm -hmm. It's terrible. Nobody can get anything done. Even the president is, is roadblocked. Yeah. So it's a real problem if we can't learn to find a third way or a fourth way and see through the illusion of separateness and get to the common good and the greater good. Yeah. yeah. So that's not just you know, intellectual. We have to do, make some steps, relational steps, actional steps, learning and inquiring steps. This Tibetan practice of tone land that I'm teaching in this book about riding the breath, breathing together, breathing into the difficulty and getting used to being with it a little longer before you reject it or run away. It's very helpful for, it's called also exchanging self and other or equalizing self and other. Mm -hmm. I think this is very important today. You know, you mentioned the mass shootings and the school shootings. When you hear why the people do it, it's often one of the things we were talking about. Mm -hmm. about feeling separate and excluded, meaningless, um, victimized, you know, pushed out. No one will listen to me. I'm going to make a statement. I have to make an extreme statement because no one, I'm not heard. Right. Yeah. We, we need to address these issues. These are universal issues. It's not just of this place or time. It's really uh, important. It is, yeah. And the spiritual practice and path is a timeless evergreen path to addressing these big life questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what would you tell someone who is practicing a little bit and, and they're you know, just kind of on the not fully committed? Yeah, what encouragement would you give someone who's, uh, who's, who knows about these practices but they're not fully uh, understanding it yet? What Nobody kind of fully understands it, you know. I don't pretend to fully understand it. And life is a mystery. Mm -hmm. And you can, the mind's only so good, you know, for understanding things. We have to live it. It's like love. Who fully understands love? But right. some people are better at it than others. You know, they become good lovers or loving people, really truly loving people, even like Christ-like or Buddha-like loving people. There are such people. Way they, to train into that. It, we don't, but... but um, you can't push people. So Buddha said, only go where you're invited, only teach when asked. So if people ask me, then I share the best that I can. Mm -hmm. In general, I don't need people to be different than they are. If they're interested, if they're looking or turning the way that I'm looking and turned, then we can start to, quote, co-meditate together, like vibrate together, and discuss together, you know, practice together. And so on. I'm not that square that I think everybody should meditate. Mm -hmm. There are probably people who should not meditate, like extreme introverts. They should have a more relational um, spiritual practice, probably, and, and be involved with others more externally and serve uh, and, and, you know, maybe sing and dance or chant together or do other things. Right, yeah. Yeah, I know Tai Chi was a big one for me because, you know, you mentioned the, the, the terrorists and all that. But my mind was, was very separate when I was young, very angry. And for me, that was a good start, uh, a martial art, but not a, you know, us-them type of martial art, but a, an internal martial art that was Yes, more. martial arts is a very good non-competitive sport. I wish they mm -hmm. taught it in schools, not just competitive sports, much as I loved competitive American sports myself. But the martial arts are like contemplation and action. And they train kids in ethics and character and courage and strength and self-confidence and, you know, self-empowerment. And it's not competitive sports. It's a whole different thing. So I'm really advocating that. And also, as my wife used to say, it's un-American just to sit there quietly and, and do nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yoga is more American than that. So, okay, whatever you say. You know, meaning just like active and body. And so... Tai Chi, Qi Gung, you know, extreme exercise. There's a lot of uh, good things we could do, and especially think about the younger people and the kids. We have to bring this into the education set system, and while people are still formative, it's a little late when they're 20s, 30s, and 40s, and the habits are so I entrenched. Is, yeah. It's right. hard to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's and, hard to change. And, I've been yeah. doing it my whole, you know, since I was in college, I've been working in this self growth and transformation biz. And it's still hard to change. It's mm -hmm. hard to change. Yeah, there's certain deep ingrained patterns that are a little harder to loosen up. 
But mm-hmm. a little acceptance goes a long way to transform your relations, which is the point. Right, befriending. Acceptance, self-acceptance, other acceptance, radical acceptance. I love Tara Brock's book, Radical Acceptance, much recommended. Yeah, 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 for sure. So there, there's definitely a discernment that you're talking about here where each individual, you know, you can't just shove down everyone's throat. This is how we're going to meditate like this for, for now on and uh, because that would be taking oneness uh, too far. The, the idea. It's aggressive. Yeah, it's aggressive. It's like missionaryizing. That's yeah. why I said, quoted Buddha about only teach where asked, not intervene. You know, not shove the truth down people's throats. Maybe, maybe you don't really know better than them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's people used to say, "How can I get my family to do this or that?" Let's say meditate, but it could have been go to church or be a vegetarian. You know, in other words, how do, can I get them to do what I want them to do? Right. I mean, that's right. a huge question, and sometimes. You know, as a parent, you have to be the boss, but that's not my situation. What we're talking about is people who want to go on some kind of journey, then, you know, you can easily be their travel agent. Yeah, right. You're not, you don't have to tell people everybody should go and travel. Not everybody should go and travel, I guess. I mean, travel's great, but maybe not for everybody and not for, I don't know, shut-ins or something. So they're inner travel also. So I think it's very important for people today to take a breath sometimes and slow down and, you know, breathe, relax, and center and smile and have a moment of mindfulness or relief or prayer, you know, whatever you believe in, and connect with yourself and where you are and not always be thinking and looking in the future or down the road where you think you're going like sit in the car and feel the feelings in your butt cheeks and in your hands not just thinking about where you're going to arrive right and and more fully inhabit your body and mind and spirit and energy and soul and then see about authenticity inquire into what you're deceiving yourself about or denying or you know you're your quote bad habits that you always want to change but never can or whatever this is all part of working on ourselves it's it's very doable it's not foreign it's not religious even it's just wise and sane and god knows we need a little more of that in our world today for sure and the head is just the office the the heart is the home try to try to Live from the heart. That's all I have to say. Be kind and, you know, compassionate to others. Yeah, and then the method doesn't matter as, as long as you're moving t- towards the heart. Yeah. Yes, and it's an infant journey, so there's no hurry. Hasten slowly and you shall soon arrive, as the Chinese proverb yeah. says. Yeah, life moves fast. You must move slowly. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, for me, that's what this podcast is, is too. Is, uh, you know, I, I have a very... Uh, I have a Zen background, but but I, I I like to interview people from all different backgrounds because I do believe just like you just said that um, everyone has to kind of find what works for them and and as long as it makes them more more loving and and move towards non separation than whatever method they use. Right, and doesn't intrude on others. Then you know, I mean, we all have the right to be as eccentric as we want to be, as long as it it fits. Not if it's criminal. So, yeah. you know, if the Nazis want to march in America, they're allowed to march because we have freedom of speech, but they're not allowed to genocide or do other things. Yeah. So um, we have to live by that. And that also means for ourselves, I believe, we have to really respect others and also respect ourselves and not try to make ourselves, everybody, you know, ourselves fit into a mold. Mm-hmm. Somebody else's mold. That's why it's so much imitation. Not, not just sit there like um, ice cubes in a tray, like in a, in a Zen monastery. Everybody on the same cushion, in the same position, at the same time. Life goes on. If you're a single mother with three kids, that's probably not going to be your spiritual practice for the next twenty years. Exactly. There's yeah. got to be another way. Yeah. There's a million w- ways to worship and to kneel and to reverence and to be beautiful in this world. All different kinds of flowers in, quote, God's garden, not yeah. just one kind, not yeah. just roses, not just lotuses. Right, 
and a lot of gardeners. And a lot of gardeners. Yeah. Well, um, I, I could just keep on asking you questions, but but I know I I got to be mindful of your time, and and I know Thank we you. we uh, we wanted to just end on if you have a favorite one of your own favorite poems that you uh, that you wrote that helps people uh, feel more uh, less separate. Let me let me uh, sing out or chant out my Millennium Prayer that I wrote and said on the radio on the cusp of Y two K of the Millennium in English. May all beings everywhere with whom we are inseparably interconnected and who want and need the same as we do. May all be awakened, liberated, healed, fulfilled, and free. May there be peace and harmony in this world and an end to war, violence, injustice, poverty, and oppression. And may we all together fulfill the promise of the spiritual journey all together now one family one sangha one beloved community all one mm -hmm. in love the heart of the matter and I bow to the Buddha in your seat don't overlook her friends it's beautiful yeah I bow and I bow to you and all the Buddhas everywhere and Christ and thank you Yes, exactly. Yeah, wonderful. Well, I'll I'll make sure uh, to uh, uh, post all the links to your website and your blog you. and your books and uh, anything else. I'll I'll uh, make sure that it's all linked on the show notes. People seem to like my Twitter feed, Facebook, and words of wisdom sendouts from zogchen.org website. So, if you could post them or retweet them. Much appreciated. Will do. Thank you, sure. Sita. Thanks again so much. God bless. Buddha bless. Well, I hope you enjoyed this interview with Surya Das. And you can find the show notes on meditationfreedom.com slash 37. And feel free to check out the show notes. I've got a almost complete transcript on there. And links to all the resources that he mentioned. And you can get to any of the books that Surya Das has written by going to the show notes as well. Each of the books will be listed and you can simply click on it and it'll take you to Amazon, which by the way also supports our podcast because Amazon gives us a little bit of credit for that. So check it out. Thank you so much for your support and until the next episode, take care. Thank you so much for joining us on the Meditation Freedom Podcast, where meditation meets daily life.